Hello and welcome to Love, Dating, and Relationships for Spiritual Women. I am your host, Julie Grimm. Really excited for our guest today. Super quickly, if it's your first time tuning in, I am a spiritual guide and healer in the lineage of King Solomon, support people on their personal paths of awakening. And today I am honored to have Katie Grimes. She is a dating coach. She's the creator of Let Love In, and she hosts the Anything for Love podcast. So very perfect guest for this. <laughs> that is for sure. How many times can I put the word love into my intro of bio it's your, that I sent it's you? Your, it's your brand. It's my love. passion. Love. love, love. It's my passion too. I hear you. I'm on like the dating side of love. Although I do let people talk about relationships here because obviously, I guess not obviously that's part of love, but I'm all about it. Mm-hmm. Me too, sister. So Katie, let's get down to it. You support people specifically uh, in love addiction. Can you Mm -hmm. tell us more about what that means, what that looks like? How would somebody know if they are in a state of love addiction? Yeah, let me start by saying that love addiction is actually a, a very deadly disease that not every, like everybody has, but doesn't know that they have. And I'm going to say everybody, it's, that's a pretty broad statement, but it's actually a disease that's more common than alcoholism and drug addiction. Um, you know, if you think about it, you know, it's this, it's the art of trying to fall in love. It is this competitive, it's this compulsive need to want to be loved and be validated by other people. It can show up in one night stands or trying to feel like the grass is greener on the other side when you're in a relationship. It can result in cheating. It can result in the dopamine hit that you get when you are swiping on social media or a dating app. It's that, how did my ex like my old post? Is it, um, you know, who, who did I match with? Um, how do I just continue to feel loved and adored? And it can also spread into fantasy addiction, which is this Again, a compulsive need to fantasize about how life will be versus what it is actually today. And that's often how we aren't able to get over our exes or we feel bad that we have to start over after a relationship ends. But it's this, con- it's this constant want and need to be loved and adored. And um, I think, you know, you can prompt me with those questions again, but I, I think you did a three-parter. So did I explain love addiction well, I was just, what was the others? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, don't go on because actually there's so yeah. much to say. So let's break it down. But um, I mean, part of when you're talking about that, I'm like, literally, that is how we, that's how we love these days. I think that's, that's the normal way that people love and engage in relationships uh, or so it would seem, you know, I'm on TikTok. That's how I like stay hip. So I still have my side parts. I'm not fully converted into like the Gen Z world, but I am sort of shocked and surprised by the um, memes, I would say, just like the stereotypes about how people relate to love, how women are relating to men, how men are relating to women. And it's exactly what you've said. Like that's become the standard operating system of how we have relationships, um, which I'm obviously I'm dating, so I can see it from my own personal experience, but to have it so widespread. And so like, that's just the norm is really unsettling for me. And I'd love to, we don't have to go there now, but what you said about the fantasy is a huge piece of it. And I can speak directly to that. So Mm -hmm. I um, do energy healing now. I work as a spiritual guide. And one major element that brought me to that path, because it was really, you know, I now do it for other people, but it was a path of personal awakening first and foremost. And what brought me there was uh, a failed relationship. And it was such a rush. It was like the the highest high that I have ever experienced. It was like, Mm. I'm in love with this person. I'm totally head over heels. This is magic. This is so beautiful. And then from that, like the biggest crash that ever happened. And I realized I, a, I was like, shoot, I got some issues. We got to look underneath the cup, you know, open up the closet, clear things Mm. out and really take a look at things. Um, you know, I need to really dedicate myself to my healing. I don't want to do that again but also just so eye-opening about what we can, how much we can hurt ourselves Mm. when we, when we buy into those fantasies and we feed them because it's like exciting and fun. So I was like feeding those fantasies day in, day out. I was like, yeah, you want another candy bar? Let me give it to you. Totally. (laughs) 
it's so dangerous. It's, it's something that I used to do as well. And I didn't know to put a name on it. You know, it's, it's meeting someone for the very first time and say you pet their dog and you walk away from the conversation and you're like, I wonder if that's my guy or my girl or whatever it is, you know, like, I wonder in your mind, it's constantly spinning. Like even before you've gone on the first date, let's say you're like wondering what you're going to wear on the second date or what you're going to talk about, or should you stand outside or inside? Like, you know, waiting for them to arrive for the date. It's this constant overthinking, not being present with where you're at today. That's why I always say before you're about to go on a date, before you're about to swipe on an app, take a deep breath and settle back into that Bob because the moment that you can do that, it gives you, gets you out of your head. And, and honestly, dating is just fun. It should be fun. It should be practiced and that should, but you know, like for me, I, I really try to look at it as though when I was going on dates, I'm in a relationship now, but when I was going on dates uh, and I was healthy, meaning I had done this inner work that you're talking about after 2015, I had noticed that I'd be going on a date and the butterflies would hit. And I would be listening to like hip hop music or something. And I noticed that if I could turn the hip hop music off on my way to the date and put on a little Jack Johnson, my energy was totally different. Not because they were like talking about hoes or whatever, in like the rap songs. I'm talking about like just the energy of the song and the vibe and the go, go, go. And, and I found that that impacted, you know, the TV shows I watched impacted how I thought about sex. And, you know, I've been on a rom-com uh, series lately where I'm watching a bunch of rom-coms on Netflix and I'm actually looking at it from the lens of a coach now as opposed to what I used to look at it which was whether it was a song or whether it was a romantic comedy fantasizing about how life could be like you know like I remember there was a song that Coldplay had I think it was called The Scientist and he talks about I'm so sorry that I disappointed you and I never meant to hurt you but like I'll give anything to come back to you and I remember just listening to that song and the tears would just fall down my face and I would fantasize about my ex who, uh, you know, I mean, any ex really, let's be honest, but like this particular ex who I had a similar relationship to that you're describing, the high was so high and we know what that feeling's like. That's actually love addiction when it's, when it's coursing through your veins and it feels like you just got warm sensation and you're, you're just like hot all over or you're sweating and you can't stop smiling when your stomach's turning, it's the same feeling that you get when it drops to, you know, when your stomach is in the pit of your stomach, it's those high highs and those low lows and just being really more aware. And we can talk about the healing and how do you heal if, if anybody's really identifying with these symptoms. Oh, I'm sure our listeners will have, mm -hmm. will, so I'm sure some of them are raising their hands because like you said, to some extent, it's like the water that we're swimming in. And so this was what was so fascinating for me because I, I mean, like everybody, right? You have a relationship, so you're kind of away from the dating pool and then you're back in it. And so I feel like, I don't know that I've just been dating for so long now or that things have really changed, but it feels like this has taken over the dating environment where, and maybe part of that is what you were saying about expectations that we might put on things or if we're saying like, is this my guy? Cause you know, when I was 24 and I was dating that thought never crossed my mind. It just, it was all for the fun and just experience really. But um, it feels like something has also shifted. And so I'm not sure if it's just a lot of people with broken hearts walking around looking for uh, some, their missing piece outside of themselves um, or if it's always been like that and I'm kind of just tuning in. Yeah, I can share a couple of things. I think regardless of if you're 20 or you're 60, I think we all have this fear that we're running out of time. And as we, you know, I, I've often heard 20 year olds say, I feel like I'm running out of time. I need to meet my partner. But then I've heard somebody who's 40 feel the same way. So, you know, I think, I think there's a, I think it's both, to be honest with you. I think it's both this concept of be just being more aware that people are, people are acting this way. I also think too, you know, we're recording this in the middle of the pandemic and coronavirus, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. And we have been told not to connect with people and we are hardwired for connection. So you're taking away a human basic need and it's driving the overthinking and the comparison and the doubt and the shame and the fear and all the shit, pardon my French, but can I swear here? <laughs> uh, sure. It's okay. okay. On YouTube. I don't know. We'll find um, out. But all the stuff that just isn't serving us anymore. And so where do we go? We go back to hardwire to, to what we know to be true, which is to connect. And I think it's a really dangerous slope in some ways that we are essentially we're, we're trying to connect with what's familiar. And for many of us, what we don't realize is that while the symptoms of love addiction that I just described are probably symptoms that many of you have either done in the past or currently doing now, um, 
if you go one level deeper, it's actually because you have grown up with some sort of trauma, whether that's just, you know, parents with mental health issues, a, a father who worked a lot, uh, a mother who was overbearing or codependent. Um, you got in a car accident when you were young. I mean, there's like all sexual assault, molestation. There's so many different types of trauma, but we'd be fools to think that we all haven't experienced some sort of heartache or some sort of pain or some sort of, I don't feel good enough. And the more that we can really feel our feelings and become really deeply aware that we are not going to experience more pain if we just sit for a moment and feel our feelings and ask for help to be able to feel them. Many of the clients that I work with, that's the number one thing they say, I, I'll ask, how are you feeling today? And they'll say, when they first start, they'll say, ah, good, fine, busy. And I'm like, oh, those aren't feelings. Here, let me give you a resource, feelingswheel.com, and let's pick three that you feel today. And it gives people the ability to, that even small exercise is to really tap into their feelings and not be afraid of their feelings. Because in 12-step recovery, they say feelings aren't facts, you know, like, it, which is so true. Like, you were excited to do this pot, you know, this video series and podcasts. And then, you know, eventually our feelings about this will stop because we'll go on to the next thing and we might feel triggered or we might be in our head about something we said. And so our feelings just kind of ebb and flow. But I think if we can really tap into why are we dating? You know, why are you um, trying to look if the grass is greener on the other side, if you're in a relationship or why are you swiping unconsciously um, to really get to the root of, what feelings are you actually feeling or that you're trying to distract from? So much wisdom there. Mm. So much. I mean, when you were talking before too about like getting high off the, I mean, it's literally getting high. And it's also this fantasy. When I think about fantasy in an unhealthy way, it's escapism. It's like you don't enjoy mm -hmm. something about your person, your present experience. So you're looking for something outside to kind of get that rush or just not be where you're at rather than deal with what's really going on for you. And it was so interesting too, when you were talking about connection, you know, and how we're wired for connection, it's almost as if rather than having, cause real intimate connection would be healing and would feel good, but rather mm. than having that experience, it's like, we're trying to connect, but we're doing it in this way that we're actually disconnecting even more from ourselves, from our, our experience in that moment. And then from people that like really and truly could be intimate with us. And the reason why is because we're trying to go back to what's familiar, kind of like what I said about the trauma that we've experienced. If you had a, let's say you had a dad, I mean, for most of us who are in our kind of like, you know, thirties, forties plus, like you probably had two parents who maybe lived in the household or separate regardless, but our generation was very much of dads worked and mom stayed home. Or if you had a single parent, like mine was, both my parents worked. And so I felt abandoned. They were not home all the time. And my grandparents raised me. And what was interesting about that is that my grandfather um, was working all the time, getting closer to retirement. And he was tired. He had already raised five kids. He didn't want another child. And that's exactly what he got. And so he was frustrated and he would push me away. He'd walk into the house and then he'd go outside to the yard and I'd go out to the yard to spend time with my papa. And he didn't want anything to do with me. Right. And, and it wasn't because he didn't love me. I can see that now. Um, but also same with my mom, like my mom got home from work and the last thing she wanted to do was get on the floor and play the game of life with me. Right. Like, she's like, let's get dinner let's get you into bed and let's, let's mom have like a minute to herself. And, you know, my mom suffered from alcoholism and my mom suffered from love addiction. And I didn't know those things that until I was well into my twenties and thirties. But what I can share with you is I always craved the kind of love from men because I'm attracted to men who would give me the same sort of one foot in and one foot out that my mom did. You know, like my mom was not available 80% of the time, whether she was at work or whether she was drinking or whether she was, you know, trying to chase another relationship. My dad was trying to do any or all of the same. And wanting, he was super consistent, but I was really turned off by men who were consistent because I was told that my dad wasn't a good person by my mom. And so anytime somebody would treat me like my dad, I would associate with this is not healthy, this is not good. And this created a, a, a cycle of codependency and addiction. And, you know, really this, this relationship with my mom that was very toxic. Um, and one with my father that became that way. And so 
I share all those personal stories because if you can look at your own life and understand what was my relationship like with my caregivers, who was around me and caring for me, who else was in the household? Like my uncle was in the household at the same time that I was growing up and he wasn't really nice at all. And so there are different dynamics that played a role into my self-esteem. I often thought that I was too much and I was, you know, cause I was a fun kid. I was always cracking jokes and I was laughing and playful and you know, I was told you're annoying. Stop. Kids should be seen and not heard. Stop crying. I'll give you something to cry about. So when you're given those messages at a young kid, you then go and replicate that in your dating relationship. And like you said, intimate relationships should be healing. They should feel safe. They should feel comforted. They should feel calm and peaceful. But I got to tell you, the stuff I'm working on as a coach and even just in my own personal relationship with my boyfriend is sometimes when it feels really safe and really peaceful and really calm, that inner child in me, that little girl who thinks this isn't supposed to be safe will come like rushing out of me and be frantic and be like, I got to get out of here. I need to travel. I need to move. I need to whatever. And that's my job to always come back to self and say, okay, wait, the grass isn't greener on the other side. I'm in a beautiful and healthy and loving relationship for today. And with that being said, like, where am I, where am I feeling not good enough? Those are really important questions to ask ourselves. And I, so can you give listeners who might have identified right now, some quick tips, like the ones that you've just given? I mean, when you start to notice sort of that fear and anxiety, asking yourself, where is this coming from or what do I need? But are there other things that people can do for themselves? Absolutely. I would say number one, check in with yourself and ask yourself this very question. It's super simple, but what do I need right now? Bathroom break, water, food. Do I need to call a friend? Like what have your basic needs been taken care of? And then really checking in with like, when you're trying to go reach out for your ex or scroll on social media, or maybe stalk your ex or on social media, um, or see really if he stalked able, you or right. You know, and being check in able on to things. Change. Yeah, be able to ask yourself that very simple question, like, what do I need right now? Like, and and the second part of that is, is what I'm about to do the most serving? Is it of the greatest good for me to take care of myself and love myself? Um, the second thing is go get help. Every single one of us needs to be in either 12-step recovery, uh, therapy, get a coach. And but here's the thing: based on the uh, symptoms that you're experiencing, if if therapy is your first line of defense, which I think many of us now think that it is you have to make sure that the therapist that you're going to is attuned to sex and love addiction. You should not be educating them. They should be educating you. Um, They should also be able to tell you about growing up in dysfunction and have understanding of trauma and not all therapists are created equal in that department. Believe me, I've tried, but that doesn't mean that if, and by the way, therapists are at an all time high and there's literally no one uh, for, um, believe me, I've tried calling and finding But what I can share with you is that many coaches have been either certified in this or have done this work on themselves, are experienced like myself, who are open and willing to take people and also have group programs so that you are in a group of people who also are going through the same symptoms of burnout or feeling unfulfilled or trying to find your purpose or constantly looking for love in all the wrong places. Like find the program that will feel most in line for you and spend some cash. The money is going to come back to you. It always will. But you can get treatment from anywhere from, you know, $50 uh, a week all the way up to, you know, thousands of dollars, depending on what you want to spend and how much time and attention you want. But and the, and the second thing I'd say is 12 step recovery is one of the most powerful tools. I absolutely swear by it. It gets a bad rap, I think, because most people say these two things, at least I've heard. I'm scared. I, I, I don't know anybody. I, I don't want to walk in there and just talk about my problems and they're talking about God and higher power. Like what the heck is that? And, and you know, what I say to people is, listen, this is a free program that you literally can go to that people of all over the world of all bodies and all backgrounds are coming together for one common solution, which is that they want to feel closer to themselves and love themselves. That's not why they get into program. They get into program to fix a person. That's what they try to do. Let me go, let my mom, you know, be who I want her to be or my dad or the boy or the girl, whatever. We try to go in to fix someone else. And what ends up happening is we end up fixing ourselves. We learn to love ourselves and we do create a relationship 
with a higher power, God, universe, something greater than us that brings us that back into this calming, peaceful, serene uh, relationship. This is a, an intimate relationship is that true intimate relationship that we are craving. It's the one with God. It's the one with higher power. It's the one with the universe. That's the relationship we've been looking for our whole life. It's right there. God is our biggest protector. I call it God in my experience. You guys can call it whatever you want, but God's our biggest protector. That's the masculine energy that we have been. And I don't say that because God is associated with male. I say that from, you know, an empowered masculine energy is that of um, peacefulness and groundedness and support and protection and that's all I think we always want is we want to feel safe. We want to feel heard. We want to feel understood. And I think that those three resources, like I said, whether it's therapy, coaching, 12 step recovery, or asking yourself simply the question, what do I need right now? You've got to be able to get the support you need because we all need it. You're not crazy. You're not broken. Nothing needs to be fixed, but you do need help. And I'm not saying that as a coach, I'm saying that as someone who is on the brink of suicide. All, all but literally 2018 was kind of the last time that I had like a suicidal thought after, um, after I was assaulted. So it's been one of those journeys where, I mean, I'm, I'm literally saying this to you, but in my head, I'm going, well, Katie, am I doing that? Am I getting to my meetings? Am I investing in coaching? Do I have a therapist? Am I asking myself what I need right now? You know, like just those little things. Yeah. Some, I mean, Hence why I love talking about dating and relationships. You teach what you sometimes need to learn the most. <laughs> so I, oh, I like to see it I don't as think I, sometimes I failed, love. I failed yeah, I so many times time. that I'm that I'm the expert now. Um, absolutely. Yeah, but, absolutely. And what you were saying too um, about investing in yourself, it's an, you're investing in your own well-being. And how many times will we spend so much money in things? You know, school is an investment. Education is an investment. But, you know, if you're going to walk around with your degrees or your beautiful home as somebody who's who's feeling broken inside or, you know, really unable to show up for yourself, then what kind of life is that? It's, it's a valuable you. thing. It's so true. And, you know, I, I think this word investing in ourselves has been thrown around quite a bit, but literally you're right. How many times have I dropped three? I mean, that's what coaching with me is for if you broke it down per week and it's not per session, it's literally like you are immersing yourself in an environment with other women who totally get you and are supporting you and loving you and teaching and saying, go, yes, that's great. Don't talk to them back, whatever it may be. And it's $300 a week when I broke it down. I looked at the number recently and I was like, at the time of this recording, it's $300 a week. Now, with that being said, like, that's not a lot of money. I used to blow $300 out drinking or going away for a weekend, or that doesn't even cover a weekend away, but you get where I'm going here. It's like, what if I were to actually take $300, $1,000, $1,500 a month, whatever it may be, and I actually had one dedicated or, or two hours a week that are dedicated just to me where someone can listen and offer advice or experience or strength. And that, that gets me to go inward. And then now next time I do go on a vacation, I'm with my friends. I'm fully present. I am not swiping on the dating app on my phone. And instead I'm with them. I see them, I hear them and I'm having the best time of my life. And that, that's, that attracts people. Like there's a term in 12 step recovery called attraction rather than promotion. You know, it'd be one thing if I walked out the door and I was like, okay, everybody, I did 12 step recovery. You all should, you can't like get to do that. You gotta like, you gotta look at the energy that you're providing within yourself. And I remember I was sitting at a bar, oh gosh, maybe 2017. I'd been in, you know, recovery at that point about eight or nine years. Um, I had been in SLAA, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, for two years, three years at that point. And my roommate, who I'd lived with for, we were going on, I think at that point, eight years as well. And she said, um, I don't know what you're doing, but you're different. And it's really awesome to see. Like, you're so much more yourself. And at that point, I wasn't drinking. I had just given up booze. And I was like, wow, thank you. And she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, really embarrassed to say it at the time, but I did confide in her. I said, I'm going to a 12 step recovery program that helps me understand what love addiction is and to understand that it is actually running my entire life ragged. And I am sick and tired of waiting for him to come, him being the one 
and tell me that I am enough. Like I'm sick of this. It's bleeding into how much money I'm making at work or not for that matter. My purpose, my passion, my friendships, everything is falling apart around me and I need to really get it together. And she was like, it's working. Keep doing it. It's amazing. It's a real testament when people can see that. I uh, joke with my friends. I've been studying in the spiritual lineage for the last five or six years. And we have photos along the way. You know, we we're, take, we're at events. We take, we we'll look at these photos and we're like, who is that? Who's that girl? And I can go back and remember like the state of mind I was in and the places where I was mentally and emotionally. And it's like, oh my gosh, I don't even recognize her. And that's, but that's how power, it's not that I'm somebody else now. I'm, I'm really just more me, exactly what your friend was mm. saying. And that's the power. If we think about like going back to investment, I don't know why I keep, I just feel really drawn to talk about this. It's like, I think about my life and, you know, I'm 33 now, but you know, when I'm 60 or when I'm 70 and having lived all of those years in distraction, having lived all those years, basically in addiction or, you know, in fantasy, trying to escape the life that I've created because I don't actually enjoy it versus hunkering down, doing sometimes challenging work that doesn't always feel good, but that pays huge dividends. And therefore like, yeah. And then having those 30 plus years of life where I'm like, yes, I'm living this. I'm, I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing. And sure. I'm, I'm going to have problems still, right? Like we're polishing the stone and we never stop polishing, but, but, but not living in so much distraction. It's interesting because this conversation is so much kind of about addiction. I've noticed a lot too, like screen time addiction, which you mentioned, you know, kind of part and parcel in with all of those things. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I'm wasting so much of my precious life mm. doing this. And there's always that underlying cause, like you were talking about, whether it's trauma or just a feeling that we don't really enjoy. So we want to not feel it, whatever it might be for us. But it's like, I'm going to waste this precious time for what? Like, why? It's um, so true. It's so, it's crazy that we do that though. Uh, and whether it's out drinking, I mean, socializing is one thing. So I can't say that a night out drinking is totally wasted, but the way that I used to drink when I was younger, absolutely. Mm. Because you, you know, at some point you don't even remember what you're doing anymore. Um, and then you feel terrible the next day. And it's like, it's so much time, precious time that you could be just, I don't know, connecting with loved ones, creating something, dancing, Building a business, dancing, anything that brings you joy. And I, I started thinking about how I think so many of us have learned from our parents that we need to save in order to retire and we need to save to buy a house. And the housing market is outrageous these days. I mean, I don't know any single person that I've met that's been able to put down 140,000, you know, down on a house just to get started or 70K for that matter. But what I can say to you is that to your point about this paying off dividends is, okay, so what if I take 10 grand and I decide that I'm going to go co private coach with somebody, or I'm going to go do whatever it may be that I know is going to, it, it's scary. I, I, I'm not really sure what's going to come of it, but I do know that I have an earning and yearning on my heart that I want to get better, that I want to feel more fulfilled. I want to understand why is it that I pack so much into a short and a day I'm running around racing and then I, and then I crash. And then when I crash, I reach for my phone, by the way, I still do this. I'm working on it actively in therapy and working on it actively in my 12 step recovery. And, you know, you talked about a lot about screen time, you know, like, okay, so my love addiction then melted into my business and trying to like, okay, I got to get this email perfect. And I got to change this and I got to change that. And even so much so that it still, it still happens. There are times where I'm still doing it. And I found myself yesterday, I had made a mistake in an email and I was, I felt so bad because it impacted other people. And in my head, I just was like, oh my God, and we just wrapped this, you know, beautiful thing. And then they're going to have this impression of it. And I was playing out the story and I, and my boyfriend said, what do you need right now? And I was like, I need to riff about what's really on my head and get it out. And I need to take a shower and wash this off of me. And then I really need to put my phone down because I can tell that if I stay here at my house, I'm going to be compulsively working to try to fix it. And there's nothing to fix. I've already apologized. I've already done what I needed to do to make amends. 
and you know they're not impacted by it and this used to show up in dating and relationships a lot too and and you know i think when we're saying relationships we're thinking you know a partner or whatever but we all have different types of relationships but it really is crucial that if you can take this time yes is it going to be painful of course sometimes it will be but i used this analogy the other day with a with a woman who wants to coach me and she said oh my god i am like all in let's do this and she's like but i'm scared and i was like of course you're scared you have been walking down this dark road where there's potholes and you keep falling in the potholes and you keep coming back to me going why do i keep falling into these potholes and i said well first off you keep going down the same street it's dark and you're doing it alone Okay. So that's why you keep falling. That's why you keep for her, for example, it was, I match with someone on a dating app. We instantly connect. We start talking all the time. We finally go on a date. Once we get on the date, it's great. It's fun. I never hear from him again. And then I go and I start swiping again. And I said, if you keep doing that and going down that street, you how, and I asked her how long you've been doing it. She said, 20 years, 20 years, you have been doing this. I said, so what if I told you that if you just walk down a different street, that is, I'm holding your hand, the light is on, and there's a, it's, the street is lined with women who are in Let Love In, who are cheering you on, asking you what they can do to support you, guide you. And then along the way, I have these little videos that pop up, which is what I do. I have videos. And the little videos pop up and say, hey, what do you want to do for self-care today? And like, oh, hey, did you want to go dancing? And oh, what do you think about understanding why it is that your mom really triggers you? Oh, I'm sorry to hear she triggers you. Let's dive a little deeper. And I said, imagine that those videos are along the way and you get to the end of the road. And at the end of the road, you now, three months later, have decided that you want to date because you're, you put it down for those three months. You feel more centered. You feel more peaceful. You feel more yourself. But now you're nervous and excited again, like mostly nervous though, because now you don't want to screw it up. You've just been walking down the street that's well lit and you don't want to go down the dark road and fall down the hole again. I said, so we keep going for another three months and I teach you how to date and I teach you what to put in your dating profile and how to put restrictions around your dating app. And like, you know, how do you have a conversation with someone who's not really trying to have a conversation with you? What does that mean about them? What are you trying, what's the story you're telling yourself? And I said, we go deeper and deeper and deeper. And she was like, oh my God. And I'm like, yeah. And it's freaking $300 a week if you actually try to add it all up. Like, it's not that expensive. And she's like, oh my gosh, I, I've been walking down a road where it's dark and alone. And I think, Julie, that's the light that you shine so brightly is like with your healing energy is that you're telling people, turn the light on, let's go down a different street and I'm going to hold your hand while you go through it. Yeah, and don't walk alone. I mean, I, so much of what you said, I see people, first of all, people don't know. People genuinely don't know, right? Like you were saying, we, we might know of a few resources, but we might not know about all the resources that are available to us. But sometimes we are addicted to our own suffering. And yes. we, it's like, we're given this opportunity to potentially make a change um, through meeting a coach or through a really amazing therapist, through healing work, through whatever that avenue might be. Um, and it's totally scary because it means change. And it also means looking at our pain versus running away from our pain. And typically there's also a financial component to it mm -hmm. too. Although I, I think people use the finances as a screen for what they're actually afraid of. Like they'll put the yes. money, they'll be like, oh, what, the money, but it's like, it's not. Well, you know what it is? It's never about the money. It's actually two things. It's either the fear that they're not going to get the results they want because they won't do the work or they treat money the way that they treat relationships, which is they have a fear that money will leave them like relationships leave them. That's really what it is. Both of which are actually a the beliefs that you have. It's the stories you're telling yourself. And I always say to people, so then let's clean up the stories. If you're reading a storybook that literally tells you, hi, you're not good enough. You're never going to have enough money. And oh, by the way, like, you know, that house that you're trying to buy, oh yeah, you're never going to get that. What if like, we just close that book and put it down and go, I'm not going to tell myself that story anymore. And instead I sit next to you. I read with you. We open the book back up and it's like, you can have anything you want just because you believe that you do.
You want to have that house and, oh, by the way, you wanted to put 20% down. Sure. All you have to do is do this journal exercise that Katie gave you. And then you can, you know, like, it's like, let's come from that place of the spirituality aspect of it. Let's come from a place that just because we are, we want it, it's ours. It doesn't have to be, do you coach with Julie or do you buy that house? No, you literally can have both. It, you literally can. It's just a matter of cleaning up your beliefs that you have. Cause all we want is to feel safe. That's really it. And we think that money provides safety. It doesn't. Does it provide freedom to like ha go have fun and make decisions that we probably never would have been able to make? Absolutely. But it and doesn't provide coaching. safety. You know, we do need to and have some coaching, amount yeah. of money. You know, if we're totally destitute and broke on the side of the road, probably, you know, Agreed. do other first, there's other first steps for you right there. But, you know, later on down the road, absolutely, money's a tool that can help us heal. And so that we don't have, like, that story about 20 years, it's just, it really hits me because I reflect on the last six years, and I know, I definitively know deep in my bones, it hit me this summer, I was like, I never would have known these things about myself had I not invested and I not really dedicated myself to this path that I'm walking to know myself, essentially. But I could have absolutely lived and died my whole darn life because that's how much I wanted to avoid those things because they were that uncomfortable. And I could have used money as an excuse a hundred times. Oh no, mm -hmm. you know, I can't invest in myself or just fear, you know, I'm, that's too risky. That's too scary. But it's like, what's a bigger risk to live and die your whole life, not really mm -hmm. knowing yourself, not really knowing what's behind those patterns of behavior that are basically causing you to like spill your precious life all over the place or, you know, taking a stand and saying, no, actually YOLO. Totally. Exactly. YOLO. And you reminded me of a story that, um, I follow this woman by the name of Amanda Francis, who I recommend to all my clients. Um, she, she dubs herself the money queen. And she tells this story about a, a woman who had invested in one of her digital courses. And the woman was a single mom of two kids living in a homeless shelter. And she, by the grace of God, scrounged up this money to be able to buy a digital course. And uh, what ended up transpiring was, uh, as you probably can imagine, she started making money. She got an incredible job. She was out of the homeless shelter. Like her family and her are thriving. It's like you have like the age old saying, like you have to spend money to make money. I truly do believe that. Like, and it really is your thoughts and beliefs around money. And, and I, I share that someday I'm going to be talking way more about money because the money that I make now, I, I remember last year when I started my business, I was a year in and in one month I made the equivalent of my salary that I had been getting at my corporate job. And that was a huge accomplishment, work, right? That's awesome. I was like, I remember going and it wasn't that hard. Like, wow, what else can I do? And I really started to listen to Amanda Francis's podcast about money. And it, she, while she focuses some on entrepreneurs, many of the women who coach with her or buy her digital courses are not, you know, are, are not, um, uh, you know, in entrepreneurs or whatever. And what I found was I was like, wow, there's this common thread amongst the work you're doing, the work I'm doing, the work that Amanda's doing around money. And that is very much self-worth. Do we believe that we are worthy of our desires? Do we believe that we are worthy of what we truly want in this world? And if, and most of us don't, many of the women who I coach with, I ask them this question when they first start and I ask it again, as they're getting to the end, what do you fear? Like what next do you fear? And we understand the stories that they're telling themselves about. I'm too old. I'm too much. I'm not enough. I, how am I going to pay for this when I want to go on vacation or whatever the else that may be? And I say, you do this work now, you go on that vacation, you're having way more fun than you ever did because every day feels more like a vacation. And it's not this like huge rush to try to, I'm um, overburdened, overbearing, and then oh, I'll get on vacation. And then it's got, it's back again in a week or two. You know, it's really being able to take that time, like you said, and really look at what it is that we want in our lives and go get it and ask for help. It's so powerful. I love that we're talking about money. Um, it does, it feels, what you're saying about self-worth makes total sense. Money, uh, you know, from a spiritual sense, sexual energy is very much tied to abundance. And so obviously we're talking about sex addiction, just addictions in general, they, they 
basically waste our life force energy. But so it's so interesting because I actually haven't talked about money yet on a show. Mm. And so I love that it kind of just went there of its own accord. Um, but it just feels like there are so many more parallels to be drawn there. So it makes sense to me that you're working with women around those issues, which are so vitally important for all the reasons that you've talked about, that just, you're just giving these women back their lives, essentially, not just in dating, but financially and empowerment to create a, a different life if they don't like the one that they've made. Absolutely. Because so many people, I can't tell you have had checks come in the mail or they've bought houses or they've gotten into relationships by investing in coaching. I mean, the stories are unreal and you can't monetize in my opinion, you know, it, it, it's hard for me to be like, you're going to do coaching and then you're going to make $10,000. You know, you see a lot of coaches do that. It's hard for me to monetize dating and relationships. It's like, okay, you're going to be less anxious. You're going to be less stressed. You're going to be more peaceful. You're going to really know yourself. When somebody asks you to do something and it viscerally is a no, you're going to have the words to be able to say no in the most effortless way without doubting or second guessing yourself that you've offended them or will you ever get to see them again? You're going to end relationships with people who have been probably your longest friends in your entire life because it's the seasons of change that you're in and you'll handle it with some tears and also some grace. Like there are just like so many things that happen if we just take this time to really understand why is it that we think that we are not good enough? Where does that come from? And how does it correlate with relationships with ourselves, relationships with other people, how we spend our money? And if we can clean all that up by thinking new thoughts, it literally is that simple, but it's not that easy because we need the accountability of somebody who's been there and done that. Listen, the stuff I'm telling you that I'm, I'm, that I teach is because I've done it or I'm doing it, or I'm actively in the car driving an hour away and going to see my parents. And then I've got Amanda Francis's on loop, or I'm listening to my own podcast, you know, it's like there's, or other people's for that matter. And just listening to stuff without overloading. Cause when you listen, you then have to absorb and then you can go take action and having accountability and being in a, a group of people who really truly get you and who understand you and don't judge shame or criticize you for having it. You're not crazy. You're not needy. You have just been through situations and circumstances that were outside of your control and you're trying to control the outcome. So you won't feel pain and you don't have to worry about that. Like you literally cannot predict the future. And that's where anxiety comes from. Anxiety is you trying to predict the future. And it's either coming from because you've had a past experience where maybe like you gave the example earlier, Julie, of like the really high, high of a new relationship and feeling like we're losing ourselves a bit. And then it comes crashing down and fearing, ah, I don't want that to happen again. But somebody, somebody um, who I'm very close with, she's been sponsoring me in 12 step for the last 11 years said, you don't have to fear that because you will, you know, way too much now. You, first of all, you know, way too much about yourself. You know what tools and resources to use in the moment. And when you don't, you forget, you call me and I remind you, like you, you, you know too much information. Now you can never go back to how bad things were because, because the moment that something bad happens. And for me, you know, one of the worst days was, or weekends, I should say, was when I was assaulted back in 2018. I, while my body and mind shut down, fight or flight just completely took freeze, took over. I literally woke up that Monday and was like, my brain kind of clicked back on very slowly. And I remember going, oh, wow, something bad just happened. What do I need to do? Okay, go call the doctor. Go call your sponsor. Get to a meeting. Can't get to a meeting today. Okay, I'll get to a meeting tomorrow. Like immediately, like your brain will start to kick into overdrive and go, we're here, you're safe, I'm protecting you. Let's use the tools that we know that will take care of you. And like the first thing I did, I remember that morning I woke up and I journaled and I started writing what happened that weekend. I still have the notebook. Um, and I, I wrote, I wrote it out. And as I started writing it out, I realized something bad had happened. And I was like, wow, it's amazing that our, my body was trying to save me during that time. It wasn't giving myself the, my brain a chance to kick back on and say, run, get out of here. Let's go. Let's call the cops. Like I couldn't do that. But what's very interesting is I think many of us don't know what those tools and resources are um, because our, our body or our brain are trying to kick us into fight or flight or freeze. 
And so being able to be in an environment where you can try to have people around you to help you is really powerful. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that story. I'm sorry that that happened to you. It's so it's so common and that's what's also so tragic and probably another reason why many people suffer from this love addiction that we've been talking about and discuss and discussing. So I know that you're going to help a lot of women. You already are helping a lot of women. So beautiful. Uh, We are definitely at the end of time. So unfortunately, unfortunately we got to wrap up, but uh, all your information is below this video. So people can uh, find more info info about you. If you want to just give like a one second, because we're kind of at time for you. Sure. Um, I would love for you guys to follow me on Instagram, kg.katygrimes. Please say hello and let me know that you met me through Julie. Um, that would be really powerful. And if you're interested in getting support, you can join my program, Let Love In, and we would have a conversation first. It's kind of like dating. I want to get a chance to get to know you, you to get to know me, and we'll talk about if coaching feels like the right fit for you. I just ask that you are single. If you are dating, that you are kind of sort of dating, you're not really committed to anybody, or you are fully single joining this program so that we can really tap into what do you need? What do you want so that you can thrive when you then learn how to date eventually? So looking forward to it. So good. Thank you, Katie. And thanks everybody for tuning.